Okay. All right. So we are uh, picking up now uh, Revelation chapter two. Um, this is now the fourth of the seven churches that we'll be looking at. We talked last time, uh, last few times about the church in Ephesus and uh, the church that has been dealing with false teachers and dealing with and testing them and proving them and being faithful to the truth, but they lost their first love, if you remember that. Uh, the church in Smyrna, they're, they're faithful and true, but they are undergoing some severe trials from, if you remember, the synagogue of Satan. That Satan's going to keep coming up again and again. Um, and saying it's a synagogue of Satan means what? Where is their trouble coming from specifically? Jews. Jewish. The Jews. Jewish. Yes. Particularly out of the Jews. Um, and that the synagogue implies there's a, it's the teaching aspect of it as well. Um, that's a place of teaching. And they are um they're they're getting they're getting trouble from them there when we get to pergamum we find satan is active there but now they're dealing with satan's throne um which implies that he's using a different group of people to deal with them to um, um give them trouble and who is it that's giving the pergamum church trouble here you remember roman government yeah. Yeah, this is the Romans, uh, the government, and particularly the Satan's throne is, so I think there's a reference to this temple of Zeus in Pergamum that was pretty famous, but it's, it's Rome and their pagan religions and the power that they would use, and they're dealing with all kinds of stuff, persecution and um, false teaching, and they need to clean that up because they've been letting it slide. They're not, uh, they're not dealing well with the false teaching, though so they're standing, it seems like they're holding fast under the persecution. Well, now we get to a fourth church, and that's in Thyatira. And Thyatira is interesting because it, you'll notice it's going to be sort of the opposite of the Ephesian church, whereas the Ephesian church was really faithful to the truth, but they lost their love. Uh, the Thyatira church is going to be really good with love and good works and service, but they're not going to be very strong, as strong on the truth part of it, and they're going to be putting up with some some troubling teaching. So let's take a look at that here. Liz, would you mind starting us off here and uh, maybe just read the whole passage for us, 18 to 29. Oh my goodness, yeah. Can you just make it a little bigger? Of course. These old eyes of mine, thank you. How's that? Good. To the church of Theatria, Theratira, and to the church of Theratira write, the words of the son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patience, endurance, and that you latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. Immoral morality and to eat food sacrificed to idols i gave her time to repent but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality immorality behold i will throw her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her i will throw into a great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will like her children dead and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in theater, how do you say that? Thyatira. 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 I don't know why I normally can say it, but. I'm clear. Yeah. Who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned that some call the deep things of Satan to you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Okay, great. Thank you. So the first part, as with all the letters, it begins in verse 18, where Jesus, who is speaking to the churches directly, introduces himself and emphasizes some things about himself. He doesn't say everything about himself, just a few highlighted items. And so the first thing he says, how does he refer to himself in this passage here? Son of God. Son of God. 
Uh, as the son of God. Okay. As the son of God. All right. And what does, um, let's talk a little bit about that, the son of God. We talk about Jesus as the son of God. What, what does that mean? He's the son of God. Second in the Trinity. Say that one more time, John. Second in the Trinity. He is. That's his reference to his divine nature in the Trinity. He is the son. Um, he is, so he is of God. He is of God, right? So I'm trying to look at how he introduced himself to the other groups. He said, uh, he doesn't see, he says the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword to Pergamum, uh, the words of the first and the last, um, and the words of him who holds the seven stars. But now he kind of gets right to, this is the words of the son of God. Uh, that's quite a, an a, a authority position here. Um, so, and that's going to be a theme throughout, you may have noticed, of uh, this theme of divine authority that happens here where he comes to judge and then he talks about ruling them with the rod of iron and uh and all this i received this authority from my father so that's that's really a point and there's a psalm uh where the famous psalm that we're going to reference quite a bit today that speaks about uh the christ this king as god's son remember what psalm that was um, we'll turn there real quick. It is Psalm, oh, the Psalm, second Psalm. Yeah. It's the second Psalm where, um, the Lord says to me, you are my son today. I've begotten you and I will make the nations, your heritage and the ends of the earth, put your possession. And you're going to hear that phrase. You're going to break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Did you hear that in that reference to, to Thyatira? those references that from Psalm two are in this paragraph where he says, first he says, I'm, he's the son of God. And then later on down the road, he says how he will, those who conquer, I will give you authority over the nations and you will rule them with a rod of iron and break them in pieces. It's the exact same phrasing as you saw in Psalm two. So, uh, he clearly has this psalm in mind, how it applies to them. We're going to find out in a second. The next thing he says, he describes two parts of um, two particular parts of that vision that John had in chapter one are highlighted in verse 18 for us. Um, first, what's the first thing he says after he says the words of the son of God? Eyes like a flame of fire. Okay, eyes like a flame of fire. Let's talk about that. Remember what that was about? Eyes like a flame of fire. What that means. He sees all. He judges. He all and judges, right? Um, he actually makes it clear. Can you see in the paragraph what he means by eyes like flame of fire? He says it actually in this paragraph, what that, that sort of implies. I don't know if you see it down there. As you, as you roll into this paragraph, he talks about out in the middle or so. Well, he's certainly going to judge. He's, he's saying what he's going to do to them. Yeah, yeah. Do you see how he's using, uh, the, he has a phrase that he uses um, in verse 23. Do you see that phrase? Oh, strike your children dead? Wow. And he will oh. strike your children. We'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Searches will oh, know no. that I am he who searches mind and heart. Yeah, he who searches mind and heart. Um, you can see that that's the eyes of fire right there. Uh, and then giving to each according to their works, this moment of judgment. He is, he's, comes with eyes of fire that can, can pierce and see, but the fire is always this reference to this kind of judgment that's coming here. When it gets, the next part it says is the, the feet are like burnished bronze. Now there's two parts to that we kind of, uh, that we can reference here. What about feet? He does mention feet down here, doesn't he? Um, I think he does. Or if feet are mentioned in Psalm 2, if they're not in this paragraph. Um, do you remember what, what feet, actually, you know where um, um, some references to feet in the Bible that might be helpful for us? 
uh, well, you know, take your shoes off and all that stuff. Um, There's that part too, but the, the, these are different kind of feet here. The the feet of bronze servant. Strength. 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 These these are not servants' feet. These are these are bronze feet that are going to crush. And remember that that whole like the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. Mm. He will put the nations. The nations will be your footstool. He will put them under your feet. It's kind of a reference to that as well. And the their burnished bronze of this, um, they're strong um, to crush. And the burnish goes along later on with the furnace and the, in a sense, kind of referencing a little bit his own uh, suffering, but that he comes through that uh, suffering to be the one of authority. Um, and so it's clear in this passage that Christ comes to Thyatira as one who is, who has all authority and power, who is coming to judge. Uh, keep that image in mind. They have perhaps lost that understanding, and it might be the reason they have lost their way a little bit here. So we're going we're gonna to come back to that in a second about why that might be really important for them. So let's take a look at the next um, verses here. Uh, verses uh, 19 and 20. And um, let's take a look at that. Rob, would you read that again for us? I know your work, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Okay. So what's good about this church here? What does he say about them that he's, he, he appreciates? He knows their works. Uh, he always starts with that word of encouragement. If there is one, what does he like? The qualities. That's it. Love, they love in their faith. Your love and faith. Service. Service and Patience, yep. patience, endurance. Mm -hmm. Service and patient endurance. Um, and that your latter works exceed the first. What does that mean? Your latter works exceed the first. You're getting better at it? They are. They are. They're growing in this. They are. They're doing more now <laughs> than they did before. Unlike the Ephesian church that lost their first love and who, who's, who need to kind of go back to the beginning what did he say about them at the beginning? He says, um, you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Uh, but here it's like, no, you're doing the works. In fact, you're, you're improving in them, which is good. That's, that's, you see that in scripture where it's like, that's, that's how it's supposed to be. Um, if you remember, Peter talks about adding to your faith, um, faithfulness and self-control and love and um, and you, you do these things, you'll do well and, and growing in these things, growing in grace. So, so their character seems to be strong and their, uh, their love for each other seems to be strong and they have not abandoned their faith in Christ and they've endured some trouble too. So that's great. Uh, there is a glaring flaw that they need to address though. And what is that? It, it sounds like they're like really good at their outward signs of yeah. being Christians, but that they're losing track of their own purity, their, their own morality, um, what God would have expect of them. So, yeah, let's, let's, let's see what this means here. He says, cause he doesn't say that they, they did anything wrong necessarily. What, what is their charge against them? They tolerate Jezebel. They tolerate that woman Jezebel. Mm. All right. So it's not that they're following her ways and practicing immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. If they were doing those things, he would not say you're doing better than you did at you start. But they're tolerating her. They're allowing her to seduce my servants so that there are some that somehow we don't know who this whether it's a person i suggest it's it's probably it may be a single person or it might be sort of a movement in the church it doesn't necessarily mean it's a woman either um it the, the jezebel is a biblical reference 
All right. And uh, we're going to talk about what Je who Jezebel was and what that all means. But that they're tolerating her, they're allowing this to happen. So it's a church that's been good about teaching the faith, and they're they're practicing, they're doing good works. But there is some kind of false teaching going on that is causing people in the church to go astray, and they're allowing it to happen. They're not addressing it. Um, perhaps you can understand why they might. Why might they not address that? But she's the queen. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, you're right she could be jezebel's a queen a excellent and that means that this woman jezebel might be a person of great wealth and power in the church or in the area that you don't want to cross and just just imagine how much we tolerate from powerful people isn't it amazing sure. you know if it was a nobody you would kick them out like that but if it's someone with some wealth and power and influence you're walking on eggshells with it. You're not, you're, you're kind of, because you feel like, oh my goodness, we can't afford to lose this. Plus, plus you, the, there's, a, there's a question of losing congregants. You know, yeah. that there's a reason why all of a sudden you see, you know, homosexual flags in front of churches. Yeah. It draws more people. And if you were to say, we're not doing this anymore, you're going to lose a chunk of your congregation. So I guess we have to have yeah, to have yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. If, if you brought them in in that way. Now, the the, the Jezebel thing here is really, really interesting. So let's talk about who Jezebel was mm -hmm. and uh, who knows anything about Jezebel. First off, um, who, just, what was her position in Israel? She was the wife, Ahab. wife of King Ahab. Yeah, she was the queen and King Ahab was her husband. Um, where was she from? You know, let's take a look at that here. Let me turn to first sixteen. Let's see, not one sixty-seven. Sixteen. Okay. And we have here uh, Omri, and then Ahab. Here we have it's Ahab reigning. Let's talk. A, let's see what the, this is. Her introduction in the Bible. This is the first we hear of Jezebel. Um, so let's take a look at that here. Um, Jack, would you read that for us? 29 down to uh, 34. Okay. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him and as if it had and as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Je, Jeroboam Jeroboam the son, of, yeah. <laughs> the son of Nabat he took his wife Jezebel the daughter of Ethbal king of the Sidonians and went and served Baal and worshipped him he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days of Hiel the, of Bethel, in his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid his foundation at the cost of Abram, his firstborn, and he set up the gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Excellent. I need to applaud you on that one, Jack. That was excellent reading on the very tough passage here. Um, so he's, we see this King Ahab, and what are we told about Ahab? He's evil. He is evil. How evil is he? most evil he is the most evil in fact it's it's in ahab's time that god determines that he's going to destroy the northern kingdom of israel it's under his leadership that he pronounces the judgment he won't do it for another few generations but that's the moment when god says you're done you are done it's over and the assyrians will come in later on to take them out but ahab he did more evil than all the kings of israel who were before him um that's that's quite a bit 
And in fact, we're told he went further than the other kings in that he, first thing we see is he took for his wife Jezebel and she is a princess, but not of any, uh, she's not from Israel and she's from the Sidonians. Um, Tyre and Sidon were these vile and cursed nations they're often compared to Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and so she's a Sidonian princess, and she is a devout worshiper of Baal, uh, this one of their demonic false gods. Erects an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, and he makes an Asherah pole. Another, I'm not exactly sure how they used Asherah poles. You know, anyone know how, how they use those things offhand? Uh, These were idols, they worship them. It was part of an. It was their part of their idolatry. I can't remember what the pole was for. How that? How that? I, I, I almost want to say it was a phallic symbol. Oh, you're right. It could that, that could be right? Yeah. You know, it's and so you can see even from the beginning, this the sexual morality was a big part of idolatry. Food and sex were the the two big parts of idolatry. Um, they would indulge in sexual morality, and then they would offer food sacrifice to idols. That was how they worshipped, and. But she's a princess, she's powerful, and she's very influential with Ahab too. Later on, as the story of Ahab goes, we have this confrontation with, uh, with Elijah. It's so bad that Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, is commissioned for this time. Because that's when the, the great prophets don't come in good times. They come in the worst of times. And Elijah comes and he pronounces a drought and... Uh, there's a drought for several years. And then we have this contest. Let's pick up, uh, let's learn a little bit more about Jezebel in chapter 18, verses one to six. Um, Bob Thomas, would you get that for us? Yep. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, and when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty caves, by fifties, in caves and fed them with bread and water. Okay, you can stop right there for a second. Um, okay. That's where it ends with Jezebel. So you can see what Jezebel's up to here. She's she's taking evil to a greater degree. She's doing something that has not quite been done before. Uh, in the past, the prophets of the Lord would come to the kings and the kings would just basically ignore them or be annoyed by them. But she's doing something different, isn't she? She's trying to wipe them out. She's trying to wipe them out. And so God has supplied this guy, Obadiah, in the household who's faithful. And he's sort of working under the radar screen and protecting as many as he can uh, from her. So she's out there seeking not just, not because before a lot, of, a lot of the pagans are kind of like, like the Hindus, sort of like, you know, everybody can, you know, worship any God you want, doesn't offend us. Just, you know, um, we're going to worship this God. You can worship that God, no problem. But she is a zealot. And she insists, she, she wants, and perhaps for her, no other God but Baal. And so she is seeking to cut off the prophets of the Lord. She's a terrifying woman, very intimidating. Mm -hmm. So we've learned she's a, she's a, a princess, um, powerful, connected, fully pagan, and um, brutal and cruel. Um, and she's really driving this down. Elijah, so much so that Elijah flees her. Uh, we had that contest at Mount Carmel, and, um, and remember, Elijah cuts down the prophets of Baal. There's a great scene of that, and this is the response. Here's Jezebel again, chapter 19, verses 1 to 3, um, where we leave off here. Let's see. Um, John, would you get that? Uh, uh, chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. Ahab told Jezreel, Jezebel, all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, 
So may the gods do to me, and more also, if you do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. So, so Elijah, who just, so go ahead, you had a question, John? Um, so Elijah, who just stood up to uh, 800 prophets of Baal and confronted them and then had them slaughtered, the next day is running for his life from Jezebel. Uh, that's how intimidating she is and how uh, relentless and ruthless this woman is. Um, and it's so much so that uh, Elijah basically goes into a depression practically in the next scene. Um, and uh, very discouraged, but she is she is an intimidating woman, powerful um, and persecuting. Her yeah, she had another. She had another. Uh, Ahab wanted this uh, vineyard. There was another story, yeah. and uh, and the guy wouldn't sell it to her to hubby. You know, wouldn't sell his vineyard to Ahab. So Jezebel said, "Just knock him off," and he, yeah. and he did. He just killed the guy and took his vineyard. Away. Exactly. That's that's chapter twenty one. Uh, unbelievable story thanks for remembering that you know it, that uh, he wants this vineyard and he won't sell it to him and ahab's all upset about it and then she says what are you talking about just go accuse him basically falsely accuse the guy have him put to death and take his plant take his property i mean she's i mean she's she's psychotic she's absolutely psychotic um, and it, her story ends it's really interesting it takes i don't know if you know who how she dies yes you know, it's, it's it falls to a death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. It's it takes another madman to basically put her to death. And that is uh Jehu, if I'm not mistaken here. I think it's in Second Kings chapter nine. She's look how long this goes on. Yeah. Quite some time. Uh is Jehu is anointed king of Israel, and Jezebel is still alive. Ahab's been put to death. And she goes on the run, and, and look at what she, they describe her death in verse uh, 30, down below of chapter 9. I mean, just think, look, did you see how many chapters we had to deal with, with Jezebel? Yeah. Did you catch that? That was like second, first Kings 16 to second Kings chapter 9. Right. That's got to be like 20 chapters that she, she is, she's in the picture still. But look what happens, how she dies. And uh, let's take a look at that. Um, Pam, would you uh, do the honor there? And uh, verses 30 down to 37. Okay. Hey. <laughs> when Jehu came to Je Jerel. Jezreel. Jezreel. Oh, that's Israel. Jezreel. Jezebel heard of it. All right, now, now you got to say that five times fast. You got to go. <laughs> yeah, <Jehu. right. laughs> <laughs> And she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out of the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, she said, Is it peace, you Mimra, murderer of your master, Zimra, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two and three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood spattered on the wall and on the horses and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank. And he said, see now to this cursed woman and bury her for she is a king's daughter. But when they went to bury her, they found no more of her then the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. When they came back and told her, he said, this is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant, Elijah, the Tishbite. In, in the territory of Jezreel, the dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of of the field in the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, this is Jezebel. Wow. Well, that's close though. 
pretty pretty gruesome. And notice yes. notice how it notice how it begins with her. It begins with her painting her eyes and adorning right. her head as she looks out the window. Right. Uh, clearly, a woman of seductive beauty, or at least in her past, she was. And vanity. Is, you know. So you can. So you're getting a full picture of her. She is. She is a beautiful. Someone went silent. Approach. We went silent. What's yeah, that? Oh, okay, now, okay, you're back. My back? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so she's a beautiful, seductive woman, powerful. And I mean, just, just the worst. Um, but you can see why everyone is either seduced by her or terrified of her. And she, she gets whatever she wants. And she even gets this, this king, Jehu, is wanting to give her the respect of a burial. She is a king's daughter but God won't allow that to happen and has the dogs come and basically take her body away and devour her. Um, mm. And she just becomes like dung in the field. That's how Jezebel's story ends. And notice how she dies. They said they throw her down. Now come back to revelation two. And let's read that one more time. That section on Jezebel. And where we leave off here, uh, uh, shoot, I should get not the second revelation. All right, so um, Julia, uh, if you would read one more time here, just this section here of uh, on Jezebel, um, who who calls herself a prophet, as verse twenty one down to twenty three. I gave her time to repent that she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mine and heart and I will give to each of you according to your works. Did you notice something here? <laughs> the phrases he uses of how he's going to judge her. He uses it. Throw her into a sick bed. <laughs> I will throw her. And not just her, I will throw in those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation too. Uh, using that language of throw it, that's how Jezebel's story ends with her being thrown off the wall and being blood spattering against the wall. It's just this, um, this fierce, just sudden judgment. The throwing of someone is a sudden judgment. It's not like she has a trial. There's no, there's no sense of expectation. It's not like she's going to be, um, it's going to come upon her suddenly not uh it's not going to be a, a, a demise that you can see coming it's going to be a sudden thing like being thrown off a wall um but in this case he will throw her onto a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her i will throw into great tribulation now um again is this talking literally is it, it perhaps it's, it's a literal woman who is doing all these things um that he is going to strike with sickness. And as and that was one of the punishments, by the way, in the, in the law, we can take a look at that real quick. Um, in Deuteronomy 28, let's turn there real quick. And Isaiah 10, 12 to six, we'll look at those two real quick. Deuteronomy uh, 28, 58 to 61. Um, let's see. Um, uh, Jenna, would you get that for us? Can you see it okay? Yep. If you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions afflictions severe and lasting and sickness grieving grievous and yeah. lasting and he 
will bring upon you again all the diseases of Egypt, of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. Every sickness also, and every affliction that is not recorded in the book of this law, the Lord will bring upon you until you are destroyed. Yeah, so, so sicknesses uh, are part of the covenant curses for their disobedience. They are promised that if you don't obey my laws, I mean, there's, there's consequences. Some may be famines, some may be wars, and you may be defeated. Uh, and in this case, it, he will send severe afflictions and sicknesses, grievous and lasting, like the diseases that you saw in Egypt are going to be coming upon you. Um, there's another passage, too, that has a reference to sicknesses, uh, as Isaiah 10, 12 to 16. Um, let's see here. This is referring to the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the boastful look in his eyes uh, and how he says, by my strength, I've done these things. It was the Assyrians who God used to punish Israel and destroy them. And now they're boasting, and he says, enough of you. And he says to them, verses 15 and 16, um, let's start by the top. Liz, you still with us there? Would you read verses 15 and 16? Sure. Shall the axe boast over him who, who, who hews with it, or the saw magnify itself against him who wields it, as if a rod would wield him who lifts it? or as if a staff should lift him who is not wood. Therefore, oh, therefore, the Lord God of hosts will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors, and under his glory a burning will be kindled like the burning of fire. So to this arrogant king of Assyria and this Assyrian army, the Lord sends a wasting sickness among his stout warriors. Now, I want to talk a little bit about there is what you see is in God's judgments, there is this um, poetic justice. Um, have you heard that term before? Poetic justice. Uh, what does that mean? Poetic justice. Good question. <laughs> it, it, it fits. It fits the picture. It does. There's a certain poetry and elegance to it. And I'm going to say that this, what Jezebel is getting is a poetic justice. He doesn't say, I'm just going to kill her and destroy her. That's not poetic. Uh, it's, I'm going to throw her onto a sickbed. Um, why it's like is that? He, it's like he wants everyone to see the punishment she's getting for what she's done. Yeah. What, what was it that Jezebel, that made Jezebel great? Uh, you, we would argue there are two things that make her just great or, or glorious, so to speak, that makes her attractive to everybody. Well, she's the queen. She is the queen. Her power and position, right? And um, apparently her beauty, her beauty, her beauty. right? Yeah. And what is it? What are the two things that sickness takes away immediately? Well, your beauty. <laughs> beauty and strength, right? Yeah. You're on a sick bed. That's the picture of weakness and helplessness. And when you're sick, you are nothing to look at, let me tell you, right? Mm. Um, so just imagine her in a hospital gown, not so glorious now, are you? Mm. And there's a certain poetry in this of the things that she fears the most, more than death itself would be probably being in a sick bed of being in that humiliating position where you can't dominate people anymore. Mm. You know, you now are at the mercy of everybody around you. Uh, you can't even take care of your own bowel movements for goodness sake. And um, you're not attractive. You're repulsive at this point. Um, so there's nothing left. I mean, it's, it's in this case, the, the, the Jezebel that he would say these things, there is, again, it's not necessarily uh, speaking in a literal fashion um, that there's a person, Jezebel, who's going to get sick. It could be, but the poetry of it, that there is this particular powerful influence in the church that you're not addressing, probably because you're intimidated by her or by this person, whoever it is. And she is causing people to go astray and you're not standing up to her and you need to do that. Um, and 
I've given her time to repent, but she hasn't. You've, this has been going on for some time now, and her day is coming up, and not, and she's not the only one who's going to fall, right? Who else is going to fall? Oh, they're going to fall with her. They have. Generations. Yeah. First, those who commit adultery with her. Now, what does that mean? Those who commit adultery with her in the church. What do you think that means? They basically follow her and and promote her ways. Yeah, it, 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 it could be she's seducing my servants to practice sexual morality. Um, the adultery, remember in the Old Testament, what's referred to as adultery constantly? Yeah. Idolatry. idolatry is always referred to as adultery when, whenever israel went after other gods they were they were c c committing adultery they were being idolatry. to god so they're there it doesn't necessarily mean that they were you know um having sex with her um but simply that they were uh, unfaithful they're going after other gods they're, they're indulging in her idolatries it perhaps is some kind of a syncretism in the church where she is kind of like what's happening in, uh, was it Haiti with, was it Santeria? Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. It's like a mixture of Christianity and sort of voodoo pagan wow. practices, and they mix them together. Mm -hmm. That could be what's happening here. And again, you would normally, you would kick that person out, but you're not doing it this time because perhaps this person, Jezebel, maybe she is one of the leading women in the town. Mm. It's possible she could be a very highly political person. And so you're tolerating it. I mean, just think about, no offense to the Catholic church here for a second. Well, maybe take offense <laughs> if you need to. But how is it that guys like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, who are 100% pro-abortion, right? How is it that they are in good standing with the Catholic Church? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? The Pope not long ago. Oh, look, some bishops have said that they can't receive communion and all that stuff. So. Yeah, but but no one of consequence has stepped up and forbidden that, right? Well, it, the answer is obvious. They're politicians. They're powerful. they're powerful people. If they weren't powerful people, they would have been kicked out of the church, and you know it. And it's not just them. I mean, we're Southern Baptists. And you know, you know who else was a Southern Baptist? Uh, Bill Clinton, and you know his church did nothing about him, nothing about him, even though his stances were completely contrary to uh, the Southern Baptist teachings on on, a, on abortion as well, and also we won't even get into his affairs and such. Uh, but they did nothing about it, again because this is this is what we're talking about: this kind of Jezebel position, a person of power and influence, who you're tolerating. Um, even though they're leading people astray, um, you're tolerating it because it's intimidating. I, I get it. It's scary. You don't want you don't want Joe Biden upset with the Catholic Church because then he might really punish you, the church and, and maybe, you know, force you to shut down and do all sorts of things. I get it. Um, it's kind of what's happening here. And on a local level, this happens all the time. You get influential people in the community who come in and basically um, have their way and can do whatever they want. And no one says boo, because they're just afraid, just afraid. Uh, it's kind of what's happening here in Pergamum, um, but the Lord will take care of it. And it will be a humbling end, not just for her, but for everyone who followed her ways. And then he says, I will strike her children dead. Again, don't think literally. What does that mean? Who are her children? generations in it, it, it could be future generations uh, that's one followers reference. the ball followers the followers yeah the, the they there's a, there's a reference in uh, first john 3 10 speaks about um children in a way similar to this it is evident who are the children of god and who are the children of the devil who does, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So the devil has children. Doesn't mean he has literal children, but basically everyone who follows his ways are his children. That's why we're called the children of Abraham, because not because we're descendants of Abraham, but because we have the faith of Abraham. That's why believers are called the children of Abraham. 
and in this case, also the children of God. So her children are going to be those who are just following her steps, following her ways, and they're going to be thrown. They're going to be struck dead. Again, this harsh judgment against them. Um, and then all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. So though you may not tolerate it, you may be tolerating it. I will not tolerate it. And I search hearts and minds. And yeah, it's, a, it's an issue. So any question on that part so far before we move on to the next section here? On, on in verse 20 here, where it says, she seduced my, my servants to commit fornication. Mm -hmm. That yeah. was also spiritual infidelity, too. Maybe there were so many of them. That's why a lot of them didn't gang up on her. Maybe, yeah. like, throw the first stone if you haven't done anything wrong or committed sin. Yeah, it could be. It's a mess. You start confronting sin like this. It's, it's, it's really hard. You know, when you come into a corrupt system, yeah. it is so hard to clean that up. It takes so much courage and fortitude to do that. It's yeah. really, I really admire anybody that can pull that off because it is so hard and painful because you start pulling threads and exposing things and you suddenly become the target and you become the one who is hated and despised. Now they're practicing, if you remember sexual immorality and food sacrifice to idols, that is something that if you remember in Acts 15, mm. the, uh, the question about whether um, Gentiles had to get circumcised or not at the Jerusalem council. And their conclusion was in verse uh, 19 and 20, uh, let's see, uh, Rob Roy, would you get that for us 19 and 20? Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write <clears throat> to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. Okay. So their, their conclusion was, you know, when the Gentiles don't need to get circumcised and they don't need to obey the Jewish laws, but they do, they really need to abstain from things polluted by idols from things associated with their former idolatry and from sexual morality. He also adds in there things strangled and from blood because they're also spending time with Jews who would be greatly offended by that. Um, but these two things of sexual morality and idolatry are, are sort of, they're moral issues that need to be continually attended to. And this group here now of pagans in Pergamum who have become believers are being perhaps given a message of you don't have to worry about it because look we're saved by grace so you can still live the way you used to live and indulge in sexual morality and eat food sacrifice to idols which means participate in this in some way and still maintain your worldly connections you can be a, what do we call them a carnal Christian is that what it's called right? You can be a worldly Christian. You can, you can be a Christian and still live just like the rest of the pagans do. And uh, that's the temptation of Jezebel, and it's leading to great destruction uh, in the churches there. So back to Revelation 2. All right, so let's uh, pick it up here. Left off here. Um, 24, now he gives uh, some commands to them and uh, let's take a look at that. Uh, Jack, would you get that for us? 24 and uh, 25. Uh, you got to unmute, Jack. Sorry about that. Okay. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. Okay. All right. So you notice the same, he uses kind of phrasing of, I do not lay on you any other burden. Uh, it's similar to the phrasing in the letter that they sent to the Gentiles, saying we don't want to lay any other burden except for... Stay away from food sacrifice to idols. Don't eat blood and don't have sexual immorality. We don't want to lay any other burden upon you. So it's kind of similar phrasing there. 
But he says here, who don't hold this teaching. So there are those in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching. So keep in mind, Thyatira is a city, right? Yes. So there are many, the church is not just one group of people, but there would have been many groups of Christians gathering in homes throughout the city. So some of those groups of Christians would be buying into Jezebel and going along with this, but there would have been other groups of Christians that would have been hold, standing against it. So it's not, it's, it's a mixed bag here we see. And he says, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. Notice that again, he brings up Satan once again. The deep things, do you know what that's a, a reference to? There are some, a few passages in the Bible about deep things. Um, let, me, let me take a look at a couple of them here. Um, I, know, I, know that, uh, I know that Peter said some people distort Paul's teachings that you know, they're so deep. You know, like, <laughs> hard to understand, they would be distorted. Yeah, that's true. In the Old Testament, there is a phrase about some deep things here, 29.29, Deuteronomy. Uh, um, it talks about them as the secret things that belong to the Lord, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So in the Bible, you see there are going to be these secret deep things and these revealed things that we can see. In our, and the revealed things are, is the law, is the Torah, it's the, it's, the, it's the Bible. So those are the things that we are allowed to know that he reveals to us. But there are other things that, that are secret. They are deep things and they belong to God. And he, in this life, maybe in the next life, he will reveal them to us. Maybe not, that he is not obliged to reveal anything to us. Um, but there is a group, and that's why he refers to the deep things. Here's another passage. Um, you find it here, Job 11. Let me go quickly here. I'm running out of time. Seven to eight mentions can you find out the deep things of god can you find out the limit of the almighty it is higher than heaven what can you do deeper than sheol what can you know so uh, there, there's deep secrets but there was a group of there was a, fa a famous heresy that you should know in the new testament times that yeah. claimed to have access to the deep things of god the no, secrets no. yeah the gnostics they were the Gnostics. They were the ones who, uh, they wrote the books that would have been titled The Secret to Something, you know. In fact, there is, there's actually a book that, that was a bestseller called The Secret. Um, and that's sort of a Gnostic approach that I've got the secret and you want it, don't you? Well, for $20, I'll share it with you, right? You know, and I'll, <laughs> what, I'll what have my claim, book. What did they claim those deep secrets were? So some of the deep secrets are uh, their understanding of, of the body, that it's, um, so it would be some, basically the, the Gnostics fell into a couple of camps, um, but their basic view was, was one of the, that the Greeks held, which was that the body is basically bad and evil, and the spirit is good. So with that, so Plato said that the body is the prison of the soul. So we can't wait to get rid of the, that's why they burn the bodies. They just, the bodies are trash, right? So some of the Gnostics, their deep secrets came to the conclusion that, well, since the body is bad, it needs to be controlled and it needs to be um, maybe punished or beaten down. Uh, you beat it like a mule, right? You got to make it do what you want it to do. And so they would encourage you to, in order to attain a higher spiritual state, you need to separate yourself from your body. So that might require fasting or doing all sorts of, what do they call that? Asceticism, where you the harsh treatment of the body. You might go, some of the, some of the saints in the early days were crazy. They would stay, they, they have these, this group of saints, this group, I don't want to call them saints, these church, these Christians, but they were kind of wacky. Uh, called, I think they're called the stylists. Um, they would live on top of pillars. So they would set up pillars um, and they would live on top of them for years, thinking that that's getting them close to God. And their disciples would, um, would basically set, you know, send up buckets of food and take down their waste 
And it was just, it was just, ugh. but that they, they were sort of, that was, that's kind of a Gnostic thing. You're sort of like ascending to heaven. And, and so a lot of the Eastern religions will give you their secrets, like me meditation, yoga, different things that you can do to escape this body and have communion with, with God or with the universe, right? The other version of Gnosticism took the other approach, which I think is what's happening in Pergamum. And that is the teaching that since the body is evil and the spirit is good, it doesn't matter what you do with your body. Um, go have sex, go do this because it's evil and your spirit is good, right? And so the idea is like, um, you know, I have a good heart. I have a good spirit, right? God knows my heart. I have a good heart. <laughs> and so uh, I, I know I committed adultery on my wife, but that was my body who did that. I'm still faithful in my heart. Um, there's, there's a, do you remember that, that musical Oklahoma? Yeah. And remember the, remember the lead, one of the leads was Ado Annie, who was always running off, hanging, kissing other guys. And she was never faithful to, to Will, her, her boyfriend. And he's, he's just upset about it. And she sings a song to him says, I am, I've always been true to you in my fashion, in my own way. Right. <laughs> I'm still true to you. Even though I'm kissing other guys and then going out on all these other dates, it's like I'm still true to you in my own fashion. My, you know, they have they may have my body, but you have my heart, right? It's so it's so pathetic. But that, that's another sort of a, a, a gnostic uh, approach to things. And so they they the nice thing about the deep things, Jack, is uh, you can just make them up. You can make up your own deep things, Jack. You know, come up with your own little ritual. And uh, sell your own books. Yeah, no one can prove me wrong, right? Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. It's you know, um, you know, you come up with your little diet plan and your little exercise routine and sell it, and boom, you know, you're a guru and you're good to go. And and people buy it. People buy it, left and right, because they don't know, they they don't know the word, uh, they don't know their left hand from their right hand, and they are just easy prey. And this woman Jezebel um whoever this person is 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 doing this kind of stuff and uh, so he says to them you know what's been good is that you have not there's some of you here who have not gone for this you've not been lured away by these deep things and notice what he calls them not deep things of god but satan, deep, of satan, things yeah. of satan right the enemy look how the enemy infiltrates He's a spiritual guru, Satan is. He is like a king on the throne, right? He is in the synagogues. He's everywhere. He's hmm. everywhere. He's on the thrones. He's in the synagogues. He's in your, in your yoga classes. He's in your, you know, everywhere it could be. Um, always on the lookout. So hold fast to what you have until I come. And then we'll kind of quickly go through this part here. The one who conquers, let's just read that one more time here. Jenna, would you read that last section for us again? 26 to 28, 29, sir. 26 to 29, you said? Yeah. Okay. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with the rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces even as I myself have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. What this church needs in dealing with this, with this trouble is a whole lot of courage and conviction. They need strength. And this promise he holds out to them, look what he promises them. If they, if they will conquer, if you can overcome your fears and confront this and clean this up and stand firm and resist the temptation to go along with everybody, stay true to my word, what will happen? What's the promise to them? He says, if you give him authority, I will give him the authority over the nations. Yeah. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. In other words, um, he's saying basically the exact same thing that I, the son of God, have. 
-hmm. you will have, you will reign with me. Um, this position of power and authority is what's held out for them. And just as I have myself have received authority from the Father, you will receive such authority from the Father. I know you feel weak right now, um, but you know, let the weak say I am strong kind of a thing. You look, this is what I'm holding out to you, hold firm. And then he says this, I will give him the morning star. What is the morning star? It's Christ in, 20, in Revelation 22. Yeah, it's Christ himself is referred to as the morning star. 22, what verse is that, 22? 16. 22, 16. That I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. So he gives of himself to him. And that's, you see that in the Old Testament where Christ is referred to as the morning star. Numbers 24, 17 also refers to him as the star. Um, and so we will, we are united to Christ. We will reign with him. Um, it's not just that we are going to be um, his slaves in heaven, but that we, we are co-heirs with Christ. We reign with him and are given authority. And Paul will make this by the way, this reminds me of another situation in the Bible. Let me find it here where um, Paul calls the church. Let me see. It's, um, I think it's an angel, right? To deal with some situations that are troubling, that are difficult. So they've got people with grievances against one another. And he says to them, you know, you need to take care of this yourself that you have to go to court against each other. So you have, you know, brothers and sisters in the church that have lawsuits against each other and you have, they're, they're suing each other in, in pagan courts. And he says, that's, it's embarrassing. Uh, don't you know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is judged to be, is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? You know, how much more than matters pertaining to this life? So when we come back to Revelation, there's this intimidation part of it where they're intimidated by this woman Jezebel um, and this powerful figure who is seducing people and they're tolerating it because they're scared. They're scared. And the idea is, remember who you are. Look, you are destined to have authority over the nations. You are sons of the living God. And this woman, this imposter, is about to be thrown to her deathbed and all who go with her. Um, stand firm, hold fast, get courage here, deal with this. Um, so it's a very, uh, very interesting section here. Hmm. I think we'll break it right there. So, all right. Any last uh, questions, comments about this section? Do you think Jezebel fitted Solomon's uh, message with all his vanity. Vanity, vanity, all she was certainly that. Yeah, huh? Vanity, yeah. vanity, all is vanity. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think I think she's a great picture of it because in one sense she she achieved all that the world could offer. Yeah. And how did it end for her? You know, yeah. Just Absolutely. it ended yeah. in justice for her. Yeah. Absolutely. Or against her. Yeah. So, all right. Very good. I will close it here. Let me uh, stop recording. <laughs>